The idea for the term 100 bagger originated from Peter Lynch's book One Upon Wall Street where he used the phrase 10 bagger to describe stocks that had multiplied in value by 10 times. Now India has seen many 100 baggers over the years and ICICI Securities recently released this list with 33 companies on it, three of whom PI Industries, KEI Industries and Bajaj Finance have gone on to become 1000 baggers. In fact, 100 baggers aren't restricted to just individual stocks and even indices become 100 baggers. For example, the BSE Sensex, which started in 1979 at a base value of 100 points, it became a 100 bagger in February of 2006 and as of now, it's a 700 bagger. Even mutual funds have seen a 100x growth with early investors in Franklin India Blue Chip, HDFC Tax Saver and Nippon India Growth Fund receiving multi-bagger returns. Point blank, we all deserve at least one 100x investment in our lifetime and hopefully this video can provide the impetus and inspiration to get there. Let's begin. I first came across the concept of a 100 bagger when I read this book by Christopher Mayer, which is a product of him studying thousands of companies from 1962 until 2014 as he narrowed his list to 365 names that had delivered a 100 times return on a $1 investment. This list included some pretty popular names like Walmart, Coca-Cola, Boeing, IBM, etc., with Berkshire Hathaway topping Mayer's list with an 18,000 times return. Remarkably, the list of 100 baggers Mr. Mayer came up with had enough diversity, that is, the companies weren't of the same type or from the same industries. As one might have expected, these companies were small, but not very small, when they started out with the median market cap coming to about $500 million. And thirdly, the time it took for an average 100 bagger company to reach there was 26 years, which mathematically comes to a return CAGR of 19.4%. In fact, there's a chart in the book that shows how long it took. And while 60 out of the 365 companies reached 100x, within 15 years, more than half the companies got there between the 16th and 30th year of their existence. So becoming a 100 bagger takes time and as an investor, if you aren't prepared to hold on to a stock for a very long time, your chances of bagging a 100x return goes down drastically. In fact, data from the US shows that the average holding period for stocks, which was 5 years in the 1970s, is now down to just 10 months as of 2022. So there is certainly a patience gap and one way of solving for that is to imbibe the virtues of coffee can investing which we had discussed in great details in another video on this channel. But to put it in a sentence, the coffee can strategy involves building a portfolio of 15 good quality businesses using a criteria set like this one and to continue holding onto those stocks for the next 20, 25, 30 years with the expectation that at least two or three of them will become mega multi-baggers and as a portfolio, the returns will be more than acceptable. Okay, so what really drives a stock into becoming a 100 bagger? And according to Christopher Mayer, there are just two such drivers. He actually calls them the twin engines in his book. And the first one is, of course, growth in earnings. Now, I've said it multiple times and also proven it in many of my videos that over the long run, the earnings of a company, sector or index and its stock price or index value moves in the same direction. In that context, a higher rate of earnings growth means a faster 100 bagger journey. And just to put it in numbers, if a business grows its earnings by 10% every year, it would take around 48 years for it to 100x its earnings and therefore its share price. However, if the same business were to grow annually at 20%, it can become a 100 bagger in almost half the time, while a 40% growth gets it there in just 14 years. Mayer's point is simple. Find companies that are growing its earnings per share at a fast clip. But having said this, merely growing the EPS is not enough and that's where the second engine is required, which is a growing price earning multiple. Now we often examine a stock's P ratio to determine how expensive or cheap a stock is. 
I won't go into details here, but when one studies a company or a sector, over a period of time, we often get an understanding of how valuable that company or sector is to investors in general. To understand what I mean by valuable, let's put these two factors, that is earnings growth and the growth in the P ratio together and look at it through an example. So I'm taking a company you know a lot about, Hindustan Unilever Limited. We all know what HUL does, right? Its products, competitors, the share price, its distribution strength, etc. Now, over the last 15 years and from a growth perspective, HUL has increased sales by 9%, net profits have risen by 11.3%, while the EPS has grown by 10.7% per annum. So the numbers are close to each other as it should be. However, HUL's share price has grown a lot higher at about 17% over these past 15 years forcing me to ask the question, where has this extra 6% come from? The answer to this gets revealed when one examines the P ratio of the company. You see, HUL's P multiple for a long time used to operate between the 25 to 35 band. However, from 2012 onwards, the perception of this business in the eyes of investors, or to put it differently, the company's valuability got an upgrade and HUL started getting priced in a more expensive 45 to 55 P band. Then in 2018, HUL went through another positive re-rating and the stock shifted to a 65 to 75 multiple, although in the past two years, the stock seems to have settled around the 60 mark. Now, this structural jump in the P ratio might be due to many factors, but generally it's the earnings potential that plays the major part. So things like any improvement in the profit margins, the loss of a competitor, so less competition, or if investors aren't finding viable opportunities in other sectors, and of course, there's a safety factor, and FMCG companies are considered as defensive sectors, especially during downturns. To really drive in the point on PE re-rating, let me take another example. So for many years, Reliance Industries Limited operated in the price earning band of 12 to 17. But then in September of 2016, Reliance aggressively entered the telecommunication space with Geo, which then invoked a stock re-rating. As one might expect, the investor community looked at Bharti Airtel's P ratio, which operated between 25 and 40 at most times and used that as an anchor to spruce up the Reliance Industries P multiple. So to put this together and as per Christopher Mayer, a combination of earnings growth and a growth in the P ratio are the twin engines and the surest way for anyone to bag a 100 bagger. This final section is on the six key characteristics that Christopher Mayer talks about in his book that are essential in our quest to identify future 100 baggers. Firstly, 100 baggers typically start out as small companies and that's exactly where you're likely to find success. I mean, look at it this way. If the present day HDFC bank needs to become a 100 bagger from here, then it'll have to become a $14 trillion company in the next 20, 25 years, which is three times the current market cap of all listed companies in India. Not impossible, but it's not very probable as well, which is why one should opt for smaller companies, let's say up to 10,000 crores in market cap and try to pick some future winners from there. It's like catching a company like Titan in the 2001-2002 period when the entire company was valued at just 200 crores, which is less than what the company earns today as profit in a single month. In fact, I cover many small cap stocks in my newsletter. These are high conviction investing ideas. I even give my reasoning for it and I hope some of them will become multi-baggers in the future. If you haven't subscribed to it yet, then kindly do so. And I'll also appreciate if you can forward my newsletter to your friends, asking them to subscribe as well. The second ingredient in a 100 bagger portfolio is a super long growth runway that allows the company to grow and expand. Now, I'm not just talking about market share here, but growth here also refers to the company's ability to develop new products, new markets, exports, services, and therefore new sources of revenue. A good example of this is Reliance Industries, which is now into petrochemicals, retail, media, textiles, e-commerce, and of course, telecommunications. If you just look at telecom, so Geo, one can see that along with mobile telephony, the company has multiple growth avenues in the form of broadband, satellite telephony, OTT platforms, Geomart, 5G devices, air fiber, and a lot more 
which are expected to last many more decades. So a long growth runway is there, which will substantially support growth in the company's earnings per share. The third characteristic of a 100 bagger is its ability to reinvest profits back into the business and earn a higher rate of return for its shareholders. It's an important variable and there are many ways of measuring this. Return on capital invested, return on equity, return on capital employed, which is generally what I use. But the common thread is that all these metrics helps us measure the compounding effect of the profits generated by a business. For example, let's say there are two businesses, one that's growing at 20% and the other at 6%. So both businesses start at one rupee per share in earnings, but after 10 years, the distortions are clearly visible with the 20% business earning about three and a half times more than the 6% business. It is for this reason, the snowballing effect that Christopher Mayer insists on finding businesses that are capital compounding machines and even puts a number to it saying, look for companies that offer a return on equity of at least 15% or more. But having said this, remember, we can't look at ROC in isolation because even today there are some excellent businesses which offer high return on capital numbers, but the business itself has matured and they might have either tapped out the market or the growth trajectory may have matured, leading to a placid 8-10% to growth, which is not going to be enough. A 100 bagger needs 20-30 years to flourish, which is another way of saying that the company needs to survive and grow for 20-30 years and this is where a strong economic moat is extremely important. So what is an economic moat? Well, think of it as a structural characteristic within a business that makes life difficult for its competitors, that allows the business to generate high returns on capital and it does that over an extended period of time. Take Coca-Cola as an example. It's the world's most recognized brand that is sold in every country on this planet except Cuba and North Korea. The company has predictable cash flows. It delivers a return on capital of over 50%, but more significantly, even if a competitor comes up with a matching product and is given a $10 billion marketing budget, it's very unlikely that it would displace Coca-Cola's dominance in the carbonated soft drinks market. So Coke's brand is a big moat and some of the other types of moats includes intangibles like a company's brand, its patents and intellectual property, switching moat which explains why people think twice about changing their bank savings account, then there's the ever popular low cost provider moat, the toll moat which is one of my favorites, the network effects moat which is how YouTube, WhatsApp and Zomato have grown over the years, the cultural moat and of course the ever expanding and controversial data moat. So when hunting for a 100 bagger always ask yourself the question, what is the company's economic moat and what is the business doing to increase the width of that moat? The fifth variable is the company's consistent track record and what Mr. Mayer found through his studies is that generally winners tend to keep on winning and building a 100 bagger portfolio from these winners is a more reliable approach than trying to get into a turnaround situation where the business is reinventing itself. In fact, Mr. Mayer takes this a step further and wants us to carefully consider the gross profit margin of a business. Now we all understand what a gross profit margin is, but if you choose to look at it differently, one can also say the GPM indicates the additional value that the company's product or service offers to a customer in excess of the cost of making that product. Apple is a good example of that, which has continually delivered a GPM of over 35% for many years now. So look for consistency, not just on the margins front, but also in terms of sales growth, EPS growth, debt levels, capacity expansion, and other related metrics. And the sixth and final point in Christopher Mayer's book is where he contends that owner-operator companies have better odds of reaching a 100 bagger status as compared to ones which are run by agent managers. To quickly explain this, owner-operator refers to businesses that are managed and operated by their founders who are also the company's larger shareholders. Companies like Reliance Industries, Wipro, Dr. Reddy's, HCL, Dabur, and many companies within the Tata Group, the Adani Group are all examples of owner-operator companies and because these owners have their skin in the game, they tend to make better capital allocation decisions, are very disciplined about cost, 
are very careful while taking in additional debt. They give a lot of thought to acquisitions. They buy back a lot of their stock and are more focused on cash flows over reported profits. Understandably, the style of management often results in better share price performance and many studies conducted all around the world have shown that promoter-led companies often outperform the professional manager-led one. So these were the six hundred bagger characteristics that Mr. Mayer mentioned in his book. But I think there's a seventh one as well, which he explains throughout the book and which I think is the most crucial of all points. Patience. Being the proud owner of a hundred bagger stock requires a strong dose of patience as one has to persist with a stock or a mutual fund for the next 15, 20, 25 years. This is easier said than done in today's distracting environment with videos, articles, news, Instagram reels saying one thing after another and it can be a case of people getting bored and then tinkering around with things often chasing the next shiny object. So the magic word is inaction, stay put and this is one type of patience. The other type of patience is one that requires us to find the right investment opportunity and it's highly recommended that one has a proper system of investing in place so that firstly you don't miss out on good stocks that can be potential multibaggers for you and secondly you don't sell off excellent businesses for some reason or the other. In that context, Mr. Mayer's advice to investors is to be a reluctant seller and likewise the great Phil Fisher rightly states in his book, if the job has been done correctly when a common stock is purchased, that is you've researched and analyzed the business well, then the time to sell it is almost never. Always remember to make money in stocks, you must have the vision to see it, the courage to buy it and the patience to hold it. Truth be told, most investors don't try to hit 100 baggers. They want to, but instead they settle for a double or a triple. And I hope this video has helped expand our thinking on what's possible. Remember, and I read this quote somewhere that says, you only have to be right once to make it big. And yes, absolutely. A 100 bagger can make a remarkable difference to anyone's financial condition. As next steps, I'll recommend you try out different combinations of market cap, ROC, gross profit margin, promoter holding, etc. On a standard stock screener and once you have a list of 15-20 companies, then do the hard work of understanding the business, the industry, growth runways, economic modes, etc. to see which companies do fit in the 100 bagger framework. Understandably, all this is a lot of work, but as I said just a moment ago, if you get it right just once, the future rewards will far exceed the efforts that you have to put in today. I sincerely hope you found this video useful. Do tap onto the like button. Please share this video with your friends and I'll see you very soon. Until then.